the last time we talked, I believe, was in February of 2020. And it's been an interesting year, to say the least. And <laughs> I, I think during that time, I've really noticed your podcast take off. And I want to spread the word about that briefly. So if you could kind of, I know it's been going on for a year, you know, a year or two prior. But can you talk just about the growth of your podcast, how that came about, and what kind of success you've seen and why people should listen? Well, I think the podcast was something that just interested me originally when I started, and I thought it could be a bit of an industry service. You know, this is my 28th year in the industry of owning a company. As the industry's really grown in that time, and, and social media is a relatively new thing, there's so much misinformation out there and just so much bullshit. And it, it's not necessarily always technical information or sometimes it's just industry information, but the stories and things that I've heard that I was there and witnessed that have just been, you know, regurgitated and convoluted and misrepresented. I thought it was an opportunity for me in some ways to tell like my story and part of my passion, why I'm in the industry and things that I saw when I was actually there. And, you know, whether it's the story of 300 blackout or whatever else, maybe some things I wasn't necessarily involved in, but witnessed. Um, and then, you know, I have a lot of friends in the industry that have actually done things, whether it be Chris Barrett and, you know, the Knight family or, you know, other people like that, that were willing to talk to and share. They kind of never would have done on their own, but I think it's interesting. And I thought there was maybe a listener for it. And so I think initially it's just a creative outlet for me and, and, a, and a way to tell a story. Sorry, I'm uh, picking some pierogies. <laughs> um, so I've got uh, my woman's Polish and her mother is uh, retired and used to own a restaurant and cooks every day. She lives in Brooklyn and cooks every day for some of the older. They live in a Polish neighborhood in Greenpoint and uh, for the older like uh, people in her community and so it's it's like what she does every day, and, and I love pierogies. And so she, every time we go down there, my woman goes down there. She sends back a suitcase full of pierogies, and wow. it's all I eat like two weeks. And so I eat them for like breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And Is that like a dumpling or something? Like a yeah, kind of like, yeah, like a dumpling. Yeah, yeah so if wow. it's all you eat, you weigh like four hundred pounds, but it's yeah. like the most delicious stuff. Yeah. And she does them with all kinds of fillings. Like there's sauerkraut and there's meat and some and. Wow. The, one I'm eating right now has got cheese and potato and it's so good. Um, anyway, so I think that was the way I just wanted to do the podcast. And, uh, you know, it was a way for me to like run my mouth, tell my story, talk about things I wanted to. And we started getting listeners, but I didn't put anything into it. I just did it on my iPhone. You know, in the first four and a half years, I guess, of Q, we had no marketing, no budget. It's just like whatever I did. And back in November, we started an actual marketing department and it's got four or five people in it now. And I want to really put effort into some of these things. And one of the very first things that we did that, you know, hopefully people will notice is we started doing the video podcast and we kind of got our own style and, you know, they're black and white and, and just having guests on, you know, and trying to get guests, especially during COVID, you know, I know a lot of people in the industry, but, you know, I fly them up here, and if it's somebody I know, they stay with me at my house. Are, are, and because of COVID, too, and the mass situation, some of the things that HR instituted at our company, I built a studio here in my house. And mm -hmm. so we do them at my house, and I fly people up. They stay with me. We let them build a gun. And it's just people that I think have something interesting to say in the industry. I am enjoying it more than just about anything else at work. I love it. And it's so neat. It's like I try to get everybody kind of liquored up before we start talking. Or sometimes they'll go on for hours and we just post the hour that's relevant. But to get people to talk about things that maybe they wouldn't or they don't think is important or people wouldn't want to hear. You know, and it's a delicate thing because some people, like we just had, you know, Nate from Begara on there. And he's the CEO and, you know, he works for a company and needs to be careful. But they're doing a lot of interesting and cool things and kind of taking up the slack for Remington. Mm -hmm. And that was interesting in its own way. And uh, we've had some other YouTubers on and, uh, you know, people like Kilo Tactical and Todd Askins from um, Tactical Distributors that are just doing things 
related to the industry, but with a little different look or outtake and story. And like this next week, the one we're going to do is a guy that I've worked with for years and years and years who is in the army he started out. He enlisted when he was uh, 18. He won best Ranger. He went on to uh, special operations, the most elite group in the history of the world and retired from there and, uh, works in the industry now and he's just got such a great story and he's such a funny guy and someone that I just know personally and love dearly and um and he'll be on and he's hilarious and this should be a great podcast. I'm really looking forward to this. Um you know, I don't know. I want to show all sides of the industry and I really want to applaud people who are actually doing things. Whether it is, you know, on, on the military side or like silencer shop on the industry side. But, you know, Silencer Shop is a, is a company from my standpoint, Dave Matheny, who owns that, one of the most innovative companies in the last 50 years in our industry. And their focus is really the distribution and paperwork of silencers. But they really have put a lot of effort, time and resource into streamlining a lot of ATF stuff, and making it easy for people to, you know, just lowering that initial hurdle and barrier to entry for a lot of people and what's intimidating an NFA going through that paperwork process. Um, and so that's a great one to do. Uh, you know, Todd Askins, uh, tactical distributors, and then Mike from Kilo Tactical, which his will air, I think, this week. Um, you know, they're into fashion. And then they also love uh, military and military history and start got into our industry and started designing garments. And that's interesting to me and creative. Um, so I don't know. I think there's all kinds of interesting perspectives and stories within our industry that nobody really considers. And if it's something that I like, then I just hope that there's other people out there that'll like it. The growth and interactions have been great. And, um, you know, I think it's just like our social media, which has been shut down twice in the last six months. Our Instagram accounts have been deactivated. We just got one back a couple of days ago. Our engagement is through the roof for the numbers that, that it shows, whether it be, you know, we don't buy followers or doing any of that stuff. And, um, you know, I think, you know, our company has a personality and I didn't set out to make friends and I didn't set out to be the richest guy in our industry. Um, but I'm super passionate about what I do and you don't have to agree with all the stuff that I do, but when it comes to product, I'm passionate about it and I'm given to the design and the engineering side of things. And I want to make a difference. I'm not trying to make the most money or make the most friends. And, and, you know, I hope that, you know, I can remain this way and that some people appreciate it. And uh, want to support it, and that I can tell a story in a, in a in a way that's different than a lot of companies do, and I can be open and vulnerable and uh, all of these things. But at the end of the day, I can explain in some way why I thought the way I did at the time, and why we developed the product that we did, and why it makes a difference. Uh, moving on, and I don't know if you could talk about this product much or not, but well, let's just start. You know, so 2020, you you kind of had the podcast going on, and it seemed like there were other projects that you guys were working on. Can you walk us through what you've what you've been up to as a company for the last year or so? Just I, I know that there's a trigger. So, well, I think the main focus for the company last year and for this year and probably next is going to be manufacturing and the growth of production and doing it in a way that's responsible. And meaning that that's just like a term people use, but to where we can grow and not sacrifice quality and innovation and uh, passion. And w what I've seen in my past and uh, for my bandwidth, I think 100 percent a year growth is about the maximum. And that's what we're doing. And we could probably grow like a lot of companies during COVID and Biden. We could grow you know, four or five X that. Um, but we're not here just for the money. Um, I'm trying to build a brand. And so we're doing that. And when it comes to individual products and uh, projects from a, a product perspective, what, you know, we never set out to build a trigger. I don't want to. Um, there's lots of companies that make good triggers. Geisley makes a good trigger. We use their triggers in some of our products. Some of the government and military groups that we work with won't accept a Geisley because you can make them double. So in shooting them, you can make them fire two or multiple rounds with one squeeze of the trigger. 
Um, so we're unable to use those and some of the things. So that led us to AR Gold. And that was in conjunction of working some with the uh, Army Marksmanship Unit out of Fort Benning, where they do a lot of testing and they have the best shooters in the world. And knowing some of those guys and, and trying to work with them, it led us to AR Gold. And AR Gold makes a great drop in AR trigger. And we were using that for a couple of years. And it we ran into, it was a bottleneck for production because they're a small company. And then also there was a couple of problems with the triggers. Uh, they didn't do tolerance stacking in conjunction with an M4, like uh, the M16 receiver drawings, the mill standard drawings. And what that means to the consumer is you can buy a trigger from AR Gold and it go in your gun and you not be able to put the safety on, for instance. And then their little manual that ships with it, it tells you how to file on a surface on the trigger to where you can do that. Well, that's not acceptable for us or probably any real gun company. So what we did is we had our engineering department redesign that trigger so that they will 100% of the time drop in to 100% of the mill spec lowers, giving their tolerances. And that's not easy, but it's, it's, it's possible. And we did that. And they also had a problem with trigger slap, if you're familiar with that, where, you know, the hammer can slam and the trigger hits your finger. It's painful. Um, and that's a design flaw. And so we got rid of that. Um, and I offered it to AR Gold because we don't want to make triggers. We just need our trigger to be right. And they respectfully declined and were not interested. And I offered it for free, and it was a lot of engineering work. And, you know, it was, well, we need our triggers to be this. And they weren't interested in making the changes. And so I said, well, okay, but you're making a competitor. We're going to have to make our, make this trigger if you're not going to make it. And you can have the trigger. It's all yours. You don't pay anything. We just need, and you can sell them, but we need ours to be this way. And they just weren't interested, and that's that's fine. And so um, we started making it, and it's in production now. And probably, let's see, what is this, May? Um, we'll probably start selling them this month, or they'll go. I'm not sure if they're going to go in guns first and ship in guns, or if we're going to sell them as an accessory first. But that'll happen probably this month. And I will say it's the best AR trigger ever developed ever has the shortest reset it's absolutely safe and 100 percent drops into any actual mil spec lower and functions safely and correctly 100 percent of the time it's a two-stage super lightweight um we eliminated a lot of stuff that uh, people on these cassette or um, drop-in trigger assemblies use where they have uh, like the bushings that creates an extra tolerance um, that the pins go through. So we eliminated those and we just use slave pins and um, it's an incredible trigger that I am incredibly excited about. Never wanted to spend our resources doing, but we did it because there wasn't a suitable trigger on the market that was reasonably priced and always dropped in and was always safe. I sometimes interview people that have strong opinions about, you know, drop-in triggers or cassette triggers, and they're always like, ah, no, don't do that. Well, there's somebody, there is someone, and I don't know who has uh, the patent on a certain aspect that most companies use of these cassette triggers, drop-in trigger assemblies, to where there is... Um, basically a little cylinder that holds everything together and then you put your pins through that and a lot of times you know the trigger spring and hammer spring don't interact with those to hold those pins in place so you have to use those goofy ass uh receiver screws you know the the trigger and hammer uh pin that have screws in them and lock together like all kinds of goofy stuff or the pins will walk but what happens is when you when you have that sort of situation, you create a whole other tolerance that your pin goes through and that you're hammering your trigger ride on. And it's not the correct way to do it. And I agree. I don't think those are the best triggers. So what we did was eliminate that. Well, like our housing or cassette just holds everything together with actual pins, slave pins, and you put it in and when you drive the receiver pins in, it pushes those out and holds these in place. So you're not having like a double tolerance stack, if that makes sense. You're, because in a typical one, like it, uh, whether it be McCormick or AR Gold or whoever, number one, they're paying a royalty. Um, number two, 
your pin goes through a hollow other pin that the hammer and all rides on. So it's like the same difference of having a thread mount silencer as opposed to a fast attach silencer where you have a muzzle device that's, you know, screwed onto a barrel and there's tolerances for that. And you have shims behind it. You get this big tolerance stack. And so you can't have the shortest reset. You can't have the best trigger pull because you, every trigger is different because of the additional tolerances that you put on. It's kind of infinite. I mean, you have the trigger pin, you have that diameter, and now you have this pin that it's going through and you have that diameter. And you're, you're trying to calculate all those things and have a trigger and parts that are tolerance to account for all of that. So you're never going to get the best product. Um, and I think we achieve something that's like a Geisley. It's like a replacement trigger, but it's not a drop-in, but it's as easy as a drop-in trigger. Gotcha. Do you have a name for this thing yet? Uh, yeah, I think it's called actually the greatest trigger ever made or something like that. Okay. Is there anywhere I can look, Google that? Act <laughs> no, but it's actually the best trigger ever made. So other than the trigger, I would imagine you guys got a lot of other things kind of working on in the background. Would one of those be eight, six, or is there anything else you'd like to yeah, let people eight, tease? Six. Yeah, there's eight, six, there's a bipod. There's the honey badger stock for regular ARs. Oh, let, let's let's talk about that. The, there was the issue with the the honey badger stock. Can you talk a little bit about what that was all about and how you responded to that? So back last summer, uh, ATF out of the blue, after doing a three month audit at our place and never bringing up anything, uh, thirty days later, sent us a cease and desist on the honey badger pistol, and they said that our honey badger pistol and our arm brace was a stock. They sent us a cease and desist, and they demanded that we send them one of each of our, the rest of our guns so they could evaluate those for free. Um, didn't buy them. Then we were working with them, and we said, okay, give us the requirements for an arm brace if you don't think this is an arm brace. And they said, no, we don't do that. You just make another one based on what you think and send it for evaluation, and then we'll tell you if it's okay or not. But if not, we won't tell you why it's not. And so just typical regulatory bullshit. So they demanded that I get all the guns back, thousands that we've sold. You know, like who knows where they all are, just like ATF doesn't know. But I had to do that, and they wanted me to sign something that I would do that. And then after I did it, that I'd gotten them all back. And us put 16-inch barrels in them. And the Honey Badger was designed, the Honey Badger pistol was designed to be a pistol. It doesn't work with a 16-inch barrel properly. And uh, I refused to do that. We weren't allowed to build guns for like six months. And, you know, we fought them. They didn't want us to go public. And they kind of stopped responding to us. And it just seemed like we were singled out. I think they were probably testing the water for banning uh, arm braces. And they were going to start with a small company. And, you know, it cost me millions of dollars in not shipping guns for six months. And I spent about 400 grand on attorney's fees. And at the end of the day, I decided to go public. And they asked us not to. Um, no one in the industry not a single company. They all know, knew it was going on and nobody offered any help at all. SB Tactical offered some help. The NRA offered some financial help, but you know, all that has strings attached. And, you know, it was far worse for a lot of other companies in the industry to lose arm braces than it is for me. Our company still survives and grows, but some of the larger companies like whoever, Smith and Wesson, Ruger, big companies, it would hurt and it would cost potentially hundreds of jobs, Springfield Armory, because, you know, a lot of these companies like Daniel Defense, like 80% of the rifle caliber guns they sell are pistols with pistol braces. Like I, you know, our SBRs are back ordered. So it didn't matter as much for me. Um, and I just decided to out ATF when they stopped responding and put it, make everything public. And their response was to send a letter suspending the cease and desist. And so that's where we stand now. And they kept our other guns that they took. And uh, we we're allowed to sell the honey badger. And, you know, that was kind of it. I mean, I think had we not outed them, you know, we'd still not be able to sell the thing. Now, in the meantime, you had, during the six-month period, you had worked on a, a replacement part. Is that correct? Yeah. Or? In my negotiations with them, for full disclosure, I offered for us to replace every brace on every gun. 
and we would design it and they just had to approve it and say it was okay. I was happy to do that at my expense. Would have cost millions of dollars, but I was willing to do it. And they wouldn't define a brace and they were unwilling to approve a brace. And what they said, the way they're getting around, you know, not being able to go after SB Tactical because they're an accessory company, so ATF doesn't regulate them, is now they're trying to say that every single gun has to be approved by them to, you know, essentially be legitimate as a pistol. Like, you don't have to have their approval. You just have to go by their guidelines. And where they're fucking everyone is not providing guidelines for an arm brace. But you have to submit them, and if they reject it, they won't tell you why. Um, So that's really the tactic that they're taking. And what they're saying is holistically, they're evaluating the gun holistically. So every individual gun has to be evaluated. So what that means is if I submit the Honey Badger, for instance, and let's say they approve it. It's a 7-inch, 300 blackout with our arm brace. They approve that. If we change it to an 8-inch, 5.56, that's not approved. That's an SP until they approve it, even though all you did was change the caliber and the barrel by one inch. Or even if you change the caliber and don't change the barrel length. That's not approved because it's not what was submitted. You mentioned a bipod. Can you get into that a little bit? Yeah. So, you know, the Atlas and Harris bipods are great. Harris is probably the best bipod, but it's ugly and got those external springs and all this stuff. But they weigh 14 to 16 ounces. They're heavy. They stick out from the gun a lot. The Atlas rattles a lot. Um, We wanted something that was usable it's what you need it's not a lot of extra stuff and definitely not a lot of extra weight and it's designed um for a need and a purpose with requirements but by engineers you know not by just a smart guy but someone who understands engineering and production so we developed a bipod for the fix that will be offered for qcert for our mounting system but also 1918 and mlock and it's half the weight of everything else out there. It is rigid, it is very simple, and it's very low profile. And it's a utility bipod. It's not for you to shoot PRS, but it's for practical use and for hunting and everything you need and nothing you don't. Like 80% use case, not for everyone. And uh, you know, it weighs eight ounces. So when do you anticipate that bipod uh, coming out? Oh God, about a year ago. I mean, I would say it'll, it'll be out this summer probably. So I think that would wrap part one of this article or part one. And then we would do a second article a day or two or three afterwards where we're going to talk about eight, six. The last time we talked about eight, six was in February of 2020, where we gave a, a 2020 update and we would love to hear where we're at as we stand oh, yeah. today. It would be in production if it weren't for the whole ammo crisis. We have production brass now and we're making millions of shells now and now it's a matter of loading time at hornady and some others and um also you know primers and powders are becoming a problem right but we've got the cartridge squared away we it's going to cost about what uh six five creedmoor costs which you know i don't go by the covid pricing but you know, before COVID, that was a dollar ten, dollar twenty around, and that's what this should be. Um, but eight six is still a six five Creedmoor shortened case, blown out for a three thirty eight bullet. We've got uh, supersonic bullets <clears throat> down. We'll, we'll see, but it'll end up the lightest bullet is going to be between uh, one hundred and fifty and one hundred and sixty grain, and out of a twelve inch barrel we'll be able to get somewhere close to 2,400 feet a second with that. And we're going to have subsonic up to about 360 grain. The first two offerings of this, and uh, it's going to be the supersonic is going to be a Barnes 210 bullet. And it's about 2000 feet a second out of a 12 and a half inch barrel. It's a one in three twist. So we've settled the twist and we're using some of the energy that's wasted converting that to kinetic energy now by spinning the bullet faster. So in supersonic, it is more energy on target, more kinetic energy, 
by spinning the bullet fast. And there's a great video, Screet Ballistics, and I can send it to you too, that did a split screen where the only difference is one's a one in seven twist and one's a one in three shooting gelatin. And you can see the one in three is two to three times the initial wound cavity of the one in seven twist. And that same muzzle velocity, same barrel length, everything's exactly the same. The barrel twist is all this different. Um, and that's the best illustration of fast twist. The fast twist also gives you the big, long, slow sonic bullet gives you uh, several things. The first being better accuracy, because when the bullet's long and slow, you need to spin it faster. And then it also, for expanding subsonic bullets, like the discrete ballistic Celis bullet or the Hornady sub X bullet, it is more reliable expansion at lower velocities, which is great for hunting with subsonic. Um, the, this is going to be the first subsonic sub MOA cartridge and that's due to the fast twist. So you'll be able to shoot groups at 300 meters that are sub three inches with the subsonic. I recently was on a hunt in Texas and shot a 600 pound nil guy bull and I can send you the video. 225 meters, 12 and a half inch fix, one and three twist, eight six, the Barnes 210, which normally they make you shoot these animals. It was a 600 pound nil guy bull. They make you shoot them with a 300 ultra mag, 300 wind mag. So one shot, 12 inch, 8.6, 225 meters. He ran 60 meters and was dead. So I'll shoot a Cape Buffalo with it in a few months in Africa. But th that'll be the first offering in a supersonic. And the first offering in a subsonic is going to be Sierra Match King 300 grain, 338 bullet loaded to 1,050 feet a second out of uh, the 12 and a half inch barrel. And then after that will be the target supersonic and the expanding subsonic. And it'll go from there, and you'll see other manufacturers as capacity opens up. Discrete Ballistics, Hornady, you know, you'll probably see Gorilla and other companies jump on pretty quick. Hornady's, make, Hornady's making all the brass. Okay. And I'll send you a picture. It's a Q-head stamp. It says 86 Blackout. And basically the way to describe this is it's double what 300 Blackout is. It's double the range. So if you're comfortable with shooting a deer at 150 yards, honey badger, 300 yards with a 12 and a half inch, 8.6, it's super quiet and subsonic as well. And we'll offer two silencer links, a short one for hunting and a full size one for the quietest thing possible. You know, another advantage of the lower velocity, even supersonic, it's incredibly quiet as a supersonic when the bullet's going 2,000 to 24 feet. 100 feet a second compared to, you know, like 3,500 feet a second. So during the wait for this, my brother, he, you know, he hog hunts down in Texas quite a bit. Lately, kind of waiting for the 8.6, they went ahead and built 338 Federal ARs, and they, lo yeah. they love them. And they, you know, if you get them talking about 8.6, you're like, well, hell, I got a 338 Federal. What would you say to yeah. someone who thinks that, and why I, is it I, that they should still be excited about 8.6 Blackout? Well, there's two things that I'll say, and one is very easy to explain. 260 Remington is a great cartridge, and it really spawned 6.5 Creedmoor, which everyone knows is incredibly popular. And the reason 260 didn't become popular and 6.5 did was the 260 case is too long. 260 was originally a 110 or 120 grain bullet. If you load a 140, 150 grain bullet in it, it doesn't fit into a magazine or a short action if you seat the bullet correctly. So they shortened up the case, used different powders, a different shoulder, made it more efficient. And you can get almost everything out of a 6.5. You can get out of a 260. And with a big, long bullet, you can load it correctly. You can seat it correctly in the throat and get full performance. You can't do that with a 260. Case is too long. We started, my, as soon as we did 300 Blackout, Ethan and I did a couple of guns in 338 Federal, Model 7s, uh, and I have them. The problem with that is when we wanted to load a 300 grain subsonic bullet and seat it correctly, for instance, like where the boat tail and the shoulder meets the throat, that's where that needs to happen. Uh, you had to seat the bullet down in the, into the case, and you don't get all the efficiency. So you, you're limited on your subsonic 
and your supersonic big bullets if you use a 338 federal 338 with that being said 338 federal inside 300 meters is superior to 308 it's an incredible cartridge but if you want subsonic capability and you want to load big long bullets super and subsonic and you want to fit them into a, ma uh, a magazine you you got to shorten the case and that's why we didn't do it to be different we wanted to start with 338 federal but you can't get everything out of it have full mag capacity long bullets have it cycle in a gas gun and fit into a short action the last time we talked there you know we were i was interested in you know maybe like a like a 12 and a half inch gas gun or you know like an ar or something like that and i think you might have mentioned that there was there could be something like a pof revolution or, or something like that, that that might yeah be, be a host for this where do we stand on a 86 blackout ar what would that platform look like and is this uh well, what's on the table? Can you talk about that at all? Since since we spoke, you know, the owner of POF mm -hmm. was killed. Yes. So so that's kind of dead in the water. Uh, I do need to reach out to them. We're going to get some of those guns and do it ourselves. I mean, you know, basically we can build because eight six as well and a nine inch is way more effective than three hundred blackout. Um, so we can build a gun, like a nine inch gas gun on that revolution or rogue, whatever they call their gun, um, that weighs almost what our sugar weasel weighs and you have twice the capability. So we're not currently working on it, but we have prototyped guns. And the very first one we did was a Nevesky and it cycled full mag capacity, super and subsonic and locked open on the last round. And we're doing it so that you can, this isn't just a bolt gun cartridge. It's not just a semi, uh, I mean, not just a subsonic cartridge. It's not just a super, it's all of it. Just like 300 blackout barrel change only, um, you know, and if you go up in a bigger bullet, for instance, people ask about 375 Raptor, it doesn't work full mag capacity in a gas gun, super and subsonic. You can't feed it and they are reliably like maybe enough for people who tinker or they're not serious about it, but it could never be a military cartridge. Um, and we're trying to cover as much as we can with this, but yeah, there'll be gas guns. And that was a huge consideration in the development of this. The first things you'll see are probably barrels offered, or we'll build the fix in a 12 and a half inch as a pistol or an SBR. And eventually we'll have 16 inch barrels available as well, um, for our rifle and, you know, whether it's Sammy approved at the time or not, we'll share uh, the chamber drawings and everything where people can build barrels for Remington 700s and also, uh, you know, stoner based guns. So AR-10, SR-25s. And, then you and can... we'll, we'll work with all those companies. Um, and, and we may eventually uh, have a, a gas gun that's available in it as well. And that would be a gas gun that might be available under the, the Q banner, like just like a honey badger or something like that. But yeah, I mean, initially we'll, we'll team with, uh, and partner and support companies, you know, whether it be Nevesky, LWRC, like Todd, um, Todd Huey, Lone Star Boars, he's got an LWRC 12 and a half inch Reaper, or whatever they call their gas gun. Right. This in the cartridge. Um, he's a good testimony to that Barnes 210. He called me and said, I've never seen, I shot a pig with it. I've never seen what I saw. And he described it to me as basically hit this pig. It did like a flip. And the very first animal I shot was a white tailed doe in South Texas. And I shot it at about 50 yards with the fixed 12 and a half inch barrel. It's Barnes 210. And she was broadside and did a flip. And I can send you a picture of the wound. It's horrific. And the next thing I shot was a 600 pound nil guy, which is one of the most durable, one of the toughest animals that you're going to have access to in North America. Um, and it was one shot, uh, the fast twist, even though we're not, you know, most of the energy when you fire a cartridge isn't pushing the bullet. Most of it's wasted and flash and sound and this kind of stuff. And we're using some of that with the fast twist. So it's not like we're creating more energy. We're just using more available energy. Now we're not using a, a huge amount of that, but it is so significant that the first time you shoot an animal, you, if you're used to hunting, you will see a difference instantly. Um, and if, you know, whatever, shoot some gel and see it, or look at the gel test or do the poor man's gel test, get you some watermelons and pumpkins and shoot them. 
um, it, it is, you know, it's not increasing linear velocity and no one ever calculated when they calculate muzzle energy, traditionally, everything is the same twist. So they've never factored in fast twists and there wasn't a lot of testing done with that. Um, but now, you know, we're using fast twists and it needs to be considered. And there is a way to model this and calculate it. And we do it in solid works. And it told us what we saw in the gel test and what we saw in shooting animals. Um, you know, this isn't like black magic or junk science. Uh, you know, and you'll see when we retrieved the bullet from the Neil guy I shot and it's a Barnes 210. It's a TSX a tipped bullet um, or a, a non-tipped bullet. But the pedals are not only um, fully expanded to where it gives you that nice flower look, but they're twisted. So, you know, you have to, when you shoot something, that target has to stop the linear motion, but it also has to stop the rotational velocity in motion. And that's where we're transferring energy from sound and muzzle flash into rotational energy, which, it, you know, enters a target and it's kinetic energy and uh it so it makes a better uh you know it makes a better hunting round it makes uh gives you the ability to use a shorter barrel at a lower linear velocity and get the same energy as you know for instance a 20 inch 308 so in the same way that you know the barnes black tip one 10 grain for the 300 blackout is you know seems like the bullet to go to this 210 is similar but just stepped up which is kind of goes along with the whole idea of what 86 blackout is would you say that's accurate I, yeah i think so you know we've got a couple barns bullets we're working on you know they have the tsx and the ttsx which means it's tipped right. and you know we developed the barns 110 when we did 300 blackout and that is the best 300 blackout bullet for a short barrel and killing and it was developed for it. um you know but you're adding a part and I don't love to tip bullets. And, you know, I, I've probably shot more rounds of that than any person alive and have more experience with it. And it is the absolute best bullet for 300 blackout. But, you know, there's compromises with everything. And the downside of the tip bullets is I had this happen recently on a pig hunt. You know, like I don't have confidence over the last few years in Barnes as they moved it to Remington and Remington went through their struggles and quality control went through the shitter. You know, Barnes used to load their own ammo at their own facility. And uh, the geniuses at Remington moved all the ammo production to, to uh, Low and Oak, Arkansas. And, you know, I've said it before and a couple of times in the last few years, I would buy Barnes ammo off the shelf and it would have four or five different primers in one 20 round box. And quality control was just shit. But I had recently where a tip came off a bullet in the honey badger and it got stuck in the, it was in the barrel extension and caused a malfunction with the gun. And if the tip comes off the bullet, that's such a big hollow point bullet, which is why it's so effective. It won't feed in an AR either. So that's not common. That's a pretty rare event, but it's happened to me a couple of times. And so I'm always on the fence with tip bullets when it comes to, you know, killing stuff and it having to be reliable. So you're going to sacrifice a little by having a non-tip bullet like the TSX, but what you gain is confidence and reliability to some degree. And let's just wrap up with a little bit about uh, timing on when we can start to expect things. And it's no big deal if it's not uh, concrete. I have no idea given that. I mean, I'll say, We've got, uh, we'll be getting a, another million shells in here pretty soon. We got the first production run of shells in last month. Powder and primers are the problem. So um, the first 100,000 rounds and maybe the first million will be utilized for marketing. And uh, this year, I mean, you'll see ammo available. Um, there are dyes available through Hornady now, loading dyes. You'll see shells, brass available. And, you know, we stopped at a one in three twist so that you can use current Barnes 338 bullets and all the bonded bullets that we've tested so far. We've not tested them all. We're not going to test them all. Um, a non bonded bullet will come apart out of the muzzle with a one in three twist, but bonded and solid coppers, the bonded that we've tested, stay together out of the muzzle. So you have some commercial bullets that you can use. And we're going to put up uh, load data 
chamber drawings and all that stuff. Um, but, it, you know, as production capacity becomes available with Hornady and Discrete Ballistics and Gorilla and some of the other companies, you'll start to see ammo available. This year, we'll also have uh, barrels for the six available, and you'll either see gas gun barrels available or you'll see drawings and us partnering with those gas gun companies and they'll be able to do it. Um, but considering the state of ammo in the industry right now, like what you'll probably see is for the first year or so, people that are into it probably having to load most of their own ammo. Um, I think the final thing, if do you have five more minutes? Sure. Okay. So that will wrap both articles then. And then I'm working on a, kind of a pet pet project article where it's just about the, the idea of why suppress a firearm. I just wanted to have you talk about, let's just say somebody's on the fence, they've got an AR or they've got a bolt gun. Why should you suppress a rifle? And if you are going to suppress your rifle, what should you be looking for in a suppressor? I, I, those are really good questions. I mean, I just went, just got back from South Africa. I shot 21 animals. It's the first time in 10 years I've shot without a silencer. And it was horrible. I mean, it just, number one, I mean, it depends on the approach you want to take. It's permanent hearing damage every time you shoot a gun without a silencer and proper hearing protection. So out of those 21 animals, there are probably four or five that the situation just wasn't available and I had to make a choice. I don't shoot the animal because it's a very quick situation. I didn't have time to put on my Peltors and then shoot. And the first time, the first shot, my head hurt for two days and my ears rang for two days, a 16-inch 308. And it sucks for everyone. I mean, it's noise pollution. Can you imagine if golf, every time you went out, every time you hit a ball, that it was an explosion that almost concussed you? Like, no one would play. It's stupid. It's noise pollution. It's impolite to your neighbors. Like, I have 100 acres here in New Hampshire, and there's neighbors all around it. And I only shoot with silencers, and they don't even know I'm shooting most of the time. Can you imagine how terrible that would be for them if I go shoot a thousand rounds through my honey badger and didn't have a silencer, like on a Sunday afternoon? Yeah. I mean, it's ridiculous. It's the only type of pollution that the government's not mandating regulation, imposing mufflers for. Um, and then I think the guns, it depends. There's just, when I started the American Silencer Association, one of the goals was to regulate the industry bullshit and come up with a rating system that was easy for people to understand. And there's some things like blowback is a real hot topic right now because somebody in the army got, you know, some sort of stick up their ass about, you know, like the toxic fumes and stuff coming back from shooting a gun because of the blowback. And then things like OSS silencers, who remarkably enough was started by somebody that was in the army at the time this happened. Um, there's a lot of junk science. If you have a gas gun and you shoot a lot, back pressure might be a consideration. But for me, I don't want it loud at my ear. And if you're sending most of the sound back through the barrel and the gas system coming out the ejection port into your ear, you know, that energy turns into sound and explosion, which hurts your ears and it's uncomfortable to shoot. So back pressure has always been a consideration to me. And there's a balance like the OSS style stuff is extremely loud at the muzzle. And if we take like our 30 caliber silencer on a 308 gas gun and we put a half inch hole through the silencer, we get the same exact blowback and muzzle noise as an OSS silencer. So they're not doing anything magical. Um, we try to balance all these, as you see, like Q silencers. And we started at SIG and we started advanced armament doing tubeless silencers. And then at SIG, larger diameter silencers. And they're even larger at Q. So the Thunder Chicken, for instance, is the same length as the 30 caliber Surefire can, but it has more than 50% more internal volume than the Surefire can. And that's just strictly due to diameter. And that results in much greater back pressure for a gas gun. Volume is your friend with that, not some magic bullshit spiral baffle. Volume is what you need. Air is what you need. And so we take that in consideration. We don't run a tight muzzle or a tight bore through the silencers either. It's very generous compared to Surefire or a lot of other companies. And so we allow more gas to escape out the front. 
but it's always a balance. Like for me, I'm a real shooter. I'm a real hunter. I use our products. If you have a bolt gun, you don't give a shit about blowback. It doesn't matter. But I want our products. I want you to not notice it on the gun. So I want them to be short, compact, lightweight, not put, you know, unacceptable amount of gas and ammonia back in your face when you fire the gun to where it's uncomfortable to shoot. I want everyone to have a great experience. Um, you know, mounting systems need to be very simple, uh, lightweight, compact. And you see how many people copy our cherry bomb and our quickie mount now. Like whether, you know, dead air with their chemo mount, that was the king of mounts when we started five years ago. They owned the industry. You know, that mounting system weighs 70% what some of our silencers and mounts weigh. And you see, they just copied the cherry bomb with their new mount. Uh, tons of people knocking it off. Um, mounting systems don't need to be heavy. You don't want to time them. You want uh, a tapered muzzle on your barrel and you want to taper to hold the silencer tight in conjunction with your threads. You don't want to have to rely on a secondary latch or anything. Um, you know, that's some military requirements and that's due to silencers coming loose in the past. And we've kind of circumvented that by having, you know, a tapered muzzle on our guns. You don't even need a QD silencer anymore. Uh, the taper that we use on the muzzle that we did at Advanced Arm at SIG and now at Q, it requires 20% more torque to remove it than to install it. So you can use it in full auto and our silencers never come loose. Can you explain the evolution of how these suppressors attach to guns and how we went, we had, you know, everything was quick to attach, but then now yeah. you don't, you don't seem to need that necessarily. Yeah, I think back in the early mid '90s with the SOP mod program, you know, Knight's Armament, they got the first big contract for silencers, and it was for the M4 rifle. And at the same time, they did rail systems and all these cool things, flip up sides, flat top lower. <clears throat> but the M4 at the time, the requirement for accuracy was either three or four MOA at 100 meters. So 100 yards, you got to shoot three or four inch group. And they wanted the silencer to go on the a2 birdcage was their goal originally, the, the military, and they didn't they didn't mind. So the uh, point of impact shift couldn't be more, than, I think, than three or four MOA, and they didn't want the accuracy to suffer. So you still, the requirement for the gun was three to four MOA. But they thought people wouldn't use them that much. They thought it would be used like 20% of the time. But once you start shooting with a silencer, you recognize the benefits. You don't ever want to shoot without them if you have a good silencer. And so people started using them more and more. So quick to attach. Nobody, like, it's kind of irrelevant for a lot of guns, especially sniper guns now. Like, you're not going to use the gun without it unless you had to. So if you eliminate the mount, you eliminate a lot of tolerance. And sometimes if it's a bad, bad mounting system, a lot of wiggle and things like that that hurt your accuracy and your point of impact shift. And these things, you know, they add weight. And, you know, if you have to have a time muzzle break, you have to shim it. And that hurts your alignment. And all these tolerance stacks hurt your alignment of the bullet coming out of your barrel through the silencer. You want it in the center of the bore as much as possible. That's what's going to give you the best accuracy and the least point of impact shift. So eliminating as many variables as possible is the best thing to do. And then also making the silencers lightweight but durable. You know, if you have a small diameter silencer, it has to be heavier and stronger to survive the higher pressure. So if you have a given pressure for a cartridge at a given barrel length, the only thing you can do to lower the pressure is create a larger vessel, pressure vessel. So a larger silencer can for the gases to expand. And so that's the approach that we've taken, not trying to make it more complicated, more expensive, uh, you know, more complicated mount to try to make things simple. And what happens is you start getting silencers made out of Inconel and Stellite and things like this, very expensive materials, cobalt, and it drives the price way up and it makes them harder to manufacture. Well, another way you can prolong the life and make a silencer stronger, and I'm using, you know, the air quotes, is to make the diameter larger because you have a much lower pressure so your temperature is lower and you don't have to re, you know rely on exotic materials and so you'll see our steel line of silencers that'll come out this year that'll mimic our titanium line but they'll be lower price and they're in steel 
And because of all these considerations, we don't have to use exotic materials and the silencers are all full auto rated. They'll survive on any gun. And it's just larger pressure, not using a t- or larger volume, so lower pressure, lower temperatures, not using a really tight bore through the silencers. And it also helps you with back pressure of the guns. And so back pressure, a consideration, not for most people, but if you have an HK416, the requirement for that gun with the U.S. Special Operations, they didn't include a silencer. And so when you put the Knight's Hermit silencer on it, for instance, back 15 years ago, that HK416 runs so fast. The gun is so slick, so well done. The bolt velocity is very high. And the magazine spring sometimes on a full mag can't keep up with raising the rounds as you fire them as the bolt retracts. And it'll skip over rounds. The bolt will go forward before a round can get up high enough to be chambered. And there was enough back pressure with the Knight's can for that to occur. So it would hurt your your performance, like reliability, which to me is, you know, obviously more important than even accuracy with the gun. Um, and so that was a consideration for back pressure to me that is way more meaningful than, you know, getting a little gas in your face. Right. Uh, but I mean, there's just all kinds of things. There is no one solution. It depends on what you're trying to do. And with Q, what we've done is we have military and government customers, but the focus has been, we know from our experience what we think is best and we're really dedicated to the commercial market and this products that are very usable and user friendly like i'll kill hundreds of animals this year i hunt all the time i use our guns every day and there's probably not a lot of ceos out there that are doing that um and and so to me i use our guns in a very practical sense you know i'm not a navy seal um and i'm not a bench rest shooter you know I shoot targets and I hunt a lot. I kill a lot of stuff. And, you know, I was, when I was just in Africa, a lot of our hunts every day were hiking miles up mountains and stuff. And, you know, one of my hunting partners when I was there, uh, he's a guy that works at Griffin and Howe, and he had a 18 pound with an optic, uh, 301 mag gun, great gun, kills the shit out of stuff. You can shoot far, but you also got to carry it up mountains. You know, and I had my stock folded and my gun slung like an AR and could shoot, you know, 450 meters and kill anything encountered. And so my experience was much more enjoyable probably than his. And, and I mean, these are just things that I think that, uh, that, that we do and thinking, you know, holistically about a system. Um, Everything that we do should be everything you need, but nothing you don't. Like our product should be awesome and cool, but not for the sake of being cool. It's cool because it's more usable and you want it more than you want a different gun. I mean, I think of all the honey badger copies that are on the market and there's a lot that look good. A lot of companies make nice AR-15s, but there are guns that copies of the honey badger that weigh a pound and a half more. They'll weigh 30% more than the honey badger and that's just laziness you know and you only get to what we're doing by taking every part and designing it and manufacturing it for the system and people think a pound and a half doesn't matter in a gun it's only because you've never picked up the honey badger and then the daniel defense honey badger knockoff or any of the other companies the maxim defense gun or anybody else um and I think we do it with, with silencers as well. Um, and, I, and just our experience, you know, we developed the robotic welded stuff that everybody uses. We developed the tubeless silencers in this country. You know, we developed the simplistic mounting systems, you know, and I think have made it all mainstream. And I'm glad that other companies are copying it and making it. I mean, you need to get everybody on board. If you've never shot a centerfire rifle without a silencer i mean you're just missing out it's 10 times the fun uh doing it with a silencer is doing it without final thing i know that people don't hardly ever have problems with their suppressors but something sometimes things happen i've had a, oh. i had a good experience with the rugged that you know they would the quick yeah. turnaround was quick but can you talk nice a little, yeah can you talk a little bit about the importance of picking a company that's going to have your back how what kind of consideration people should have as they're shopping for suppressors 
Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I, I will say, of course, several things. First is the best customer service is always delivering the best product. That's my philosophy. Secondly, shit's always going to go wrong. There's always going to be a problem. Um, I, I mean, it's it's rare with us, but it happens. You know, we sell thousands, you know, tens of thousands of silencers a year. Stuff's going to happen, whether it's our fault or, or generally it's like end user fault. It truly is. And that's not displacing blame. It's just people get a silencer they don't know. They don't install them out correctly. That You know, there's just a million things that happen. And it's all okay. If people are reasonable, I don't care whose fault it is. I don't care. And we've done this. Somebody ran over his fixed rifle with a truck and a trailer. And we gave him a brand new gun. All he did was send the one back. But, you know, he was real cool about it. He contacted us, told us what actually happened. And we said, you know, he sent it in. And I was like, this will be great for marketing to send the guy another gun. And we did that. And I think most of the companies out there are probably going to take care of you. I think things that we did that are important, when you have a tube silencer and the tube is engraved and you damage that, you can't replace it. Right. And that can be difficult. So the, with our tubeless silencers, the rear mount is engraved. And if you do something stupid and you ding some baffles or the front end cap, whatever happens, we can cut that baffle core off weld a new one on it and either coat it or if you don't want to wait for the pvd process be blast it and send it right back to you it's simple um you know, you know i we're always going to do more than our part for the customer um you know it's you i mean it, even if you were inclined to screw people over you just can't get away with stuff with social media and all anymore so i don't know that companies survive that have that mentality but um you know, I'm grateful for the business we're going to take care of, but supporting a company, you know, I mean, I think it advanced armament. I also did a great job with that, but you know, I sold the company to some dirt bags and it turns out they didn't take care of customers. And now there's a lot of people that uh, bought advanced armament silencers where I would have taken care of them forever. And now they're hosed. So I don't know long-term, you know, what the right answer is, but a company that you're comfortable with, um, and I think most companies will take care of you, but I know, for instance, like dead air's rate of return based on quality control and failures is probably a hundred times what ours is. And I think dead air is probably a fine company, but they don't employ mechanical engineers and I do. And I think we develop and provide the best product. You know, I'm not trying to make the most silencers. I'm trying to make the best and give the users the best experience possible. And you ever have something go wrong with our stuff, it's going to be handled correctly. Um, and we're going to go above and beyond to take care of people. And I do think there's a lot of people like that. But I'll wrap it up by saying, you know, we had when we had 11 people. I think we had six degreed engineers, which was when our company was 11 people. We had more engineers than Daniel Defense silencer co and dead air combined um and your customer service starts with the passion of the leadership and demanding the best product be developed in the beginning and no compromises in quality to you know squeeze out a little extra margin and those are the companies you know for me i love our industry i love guns i support companies like us that are changing things improving things and driving innovation and competition and that's where i want my money to go whether it's guns or anything else i support all right well i really appreciate your time today sure uh, thank you this of will course. probably be three different articles by the time i'm done so uh again i appreciate it the way i've got this You're recorded if it turned out okay could i use the audio or would you rather just be yeah. print I don't care. Do do whatever serves you best. I'm fine with any of it. Right. And just text me all the pictures that you want. And uh, over the next day or so, I'll gather them up and text them over to you. Well, I've been collecting pictures that, you know, over the last couple of weeks. I figured I'd, I wanted to have everything together before I reached out to you. So I think I'm okay. good. Um, when you went to Africa recently, was that mostly shooting with 308 or were you, did you have an 86 blackout in the mix over there? No. Um, I had the 86 in South Texas a couple months ago. I took 16-inch 308 and 16-inch 65 Creedmoor to Africa, and I used um, 
308, I use 165 GMX solid coppers from Hornady, and I used 143 ELDX um, lead bonded bullets in uh, in 65, okay. uh, but 16 barrels. And uh, but I'll go back in uh, two or three months, and I'm taking eight six, and I'm gonna kill uh, some big stuff. I'm killing all the big game with a uh, 12 inch eight six. Cool. Well, if you've got a p- cool picture of an eight six on on your phone, you can just shoot me a text or two of those. Otherwise, I think I'm good. Yeah. But I've got your text uh, here. I might shoot you a question. I'm gonna try to get one of these uh, articles out tomorrow. So uh, I don't, I don't okay. know which one we'll do first, but. Uh... It okay. might be eight six, but again, I appreciate your time. Thank you so much, and I hope all Thank is you, well for you. And uh, keep doing good things. We 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 love hearing from you and watching what you do. Well, thank you so much. The same to you guys. Take care. All right. Goodbye.